Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Podcast. Today is February 22nd, 2023, and I am speaking with Andrew Spool. Andrew Spool went to the uh, Family Foundation School in Hancock, New York from 2007 to 2008, and he's going to give us his story. Go ahead, Andrew. Floor is all yours. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> by anyone's est, I was a, I was adopted at birth, you know, and uh, no one ever tried to hide that from me. You know, as, er as early as I was able to, like, comprehend what adoption was, you know, I was told about it. So um, I don't really have any qualms about being adopted. It presents its own problems, but whatever, you know. Um, by... Uh, when I was two years old, um, my mother, she had a lapse in judgment, but it wasn't ultimately her fault. But I had a traumatic brain injury. I fell down an entire flight of stairs and bam, had a huge hematoma right here at two years oh, old. And ouch. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it took a hit to like my executive functioning skills and stuff. So, um, you know, I'm lucky I can walk and talk as a friend of mine said recently, you know. And, um, but the, the full, like, effect it had on my behavior or whatever remains to be seen, you know, I don't know, uh, sometimes the worst thing about traumatic brain injury is if it doesn't make you a vegetable is like, uh, the, the way it changes memories, the way it changes emotions, that kind of thing. Like in retrospect, it's hard to, it's hard to come to terms with that. Um, either way. The reason I say that is because by most people's estimate, I was a difficult kid. You know, I was a, a, uh, a troublemaker. Um, didn't get into a whole lot of fights, but I, I was just, I guess, generally a ne'er-do-well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, which I, which I kind of, I think is funny at this point in my life, you know? Well, you because, know, some, uh, sometimes, sometimes injuries like that can also affect your, uh, your, your behavior as well yes yes and i've there's like at, at this point um having healed from a lot of the story that i told myself about you know the way that my life went down um i i don't i don't i don't regret you know the person that i could have been you know what i mean anymore right i, I used to and i used to have a lot of anger towards people about that you know um Mo mainly like anyone who was trying to help me, any specialists that were trying to help me growing up. But um, setting the stage, you know, like <clears throat> um, wasn't doing well in public school, you know, uh, not for lack of ability, you know, and went to private school after private school. Eventually, you know, I found a crowd of people who I jived with and um, they liked weed and they liked cocaine, you know. And uh, so by the time I was 16, I was I was pretty much like cocaine binging and stealing from my parents in excess to pay for it, you know, and um, <clears throat> my parents are pretty well off. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, so like I didn't have I didn't have any I had moral objections to that, but whatever. So my parents are worried about me, r rightly so, I think. Um you know, I, I'm five foot nine and I weigh like 170 now, but at that time I was like, I couldn't have been more than 110, 115, you know? And, uh, how old were you? Uh, when I got sent or when I, when you, at when that, you got sent, when you got sent, I was, it was Feb, my birthday's in June and I was going to turn 18. So I was, so I was like four months from being 18. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so where was I? Right. Um, so <clears throat> I knew what I was doing was like not sustainable. Like I saw myself being dead at like, I couldn't see myself making it to like 22, you know, like I, I, I had emotional mental problems long before I went to the family school. And I say, I say that, and it doesn't detract from anything I'm about to say. I want to make that clear. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, in fact, it's, it may have made things more complicated in my particular situation. <clears throat> so 
as it as it goes with cocaine and i'm sure that some people will confirm this like uh lying becomes a necessity at a certain point you know unless someone is just bankrolled to the gills and uh so i had no concept of like i'd given up on certain like certain morals and you know what i mean um <clears throat> but i was depressed i was depressed and i was scared and i was like at the most sad and depressed and vulnerable point in my life at that point and so i didn't know what was going on they tried to put me on uh pins like persons in need of supervision that kind of thing but you know i just stopped going to that and uh you know um my parents aren't the type of people to press charges against their own son for like grand larceny, you know, but I think yeah. the amount of money that I stole might've qualified for grand larceny or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so my parents one night, because I just obviously didn't want them to know about my drug use. They, I'd like took a piss and they put one of those dip tests in the toilet and, oh. um, yeah, and it came back high positive for cocaine, which well, obviously. And um, I didn't know about this until after uh, my stay at the school. But so February 5th, 2007, at about 3.30 a.m., uh, I get woken up with in my bed, one, one guy at the foot of the bed, one guy at the side of the bed, looming over me you know and um <clears throat> which in itself is like what the f can, I, can i can i curse on here sure uh, so it's like what the fuck are you doing in my room you know i didn't allow my parents in my room i was like i was my first reaction was like fear like abject fear um and then after that it was there was almost like a sense of relief, I guess, like immediately after that in the sense of like, oh, someone's going to help me. Right. Because right. like, I, I wanted some kind of help. I was like, oh, it's over. Like, I don't have to. They're going to take me somewhere safe. Right. Um, <clears throat> but then, like, I got back. I snapped back to reality of some kind and something just didn't seem right about it. And I looked behind them and I saw my parents like hold holding each other in the doorway and they're like, we love you, you know? And the, the amount of, I felt so much betrayal in that moment. I really felt like a strong sense of betrayal in that moment. Um, Pretty much. How, how could your parents do this to you? Basically. Yeah. Plus, plus the story that I told myself about the adoption, like my birth mother is in prison for life. She's in prison for capital murder in the state of Louisiana, narrowly avoided the chair um, that kind of thing. So in my mind, my adoptive parents were my saviors and they were going to protect me at all costs. And then letting two huge men into my room in the middle of the night after a cocaine binge in my most vulnerable state, um, you know, later, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in one of your previous, uh, like two parents videos, uh, about warning signs and red flags about like, Oh no no no! You need to send him in now, like now. It needs to be. You know what I mean? Like right, right. Yeah. Like, like, so, like somehow they know all the specifics about my situation already. It's like already playing on my parents' fears to make a, dis a rash decision, right? Without you know any, what I'm saying? Without any type of evaluation, they're basically yeah. just armchair psychologizing you and saying, "Okay, this is what he needs. We think so. Let's do it right now." You know? Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's like, yeah, it's like worse than armchair, whatever. Uh, but yes, basically. So I, you know, they walked me out of the house and like, I was like, if I try to get away, it's just going to make it worse. Like I can already tell that it's just going to make it worse. You know what I mean? Because they... They were like empty. I don't know how to describe it, but right. as empty as I was in that moment, I was like, these guys are empty. They're empty Did, people. I don't know were, why. Were they armed with anything? Um, 
No, they weren't. I don't. They didn't have to be. They're pretty big. Like, yeah, they didn't have to be because they already knew enough about me. I guess. I don't know how. See, that's the thing though. At that point, I don't know how much they knew about me. I still don't. Um, like how much information my parents actually divulged to them about my situation, but you know. They could have been armed. I don't know, but I'm not gonna like insinuate that they were when I don't know that they were for sure. I sp- so anyway, I get in the back of a Dodge Charger, and they're both in the front, and I say, "Where are we going?" You know, and they're and I don't even remember what they said. I can't imagine they gave me a, de- a definitive answer. So, two hours later or so, maybe less. I oh in my head, um, I end up in a. Uh, I get out of the car and I see what we're pulling up to and it looks like some sort of farm and I'm thinking like equine therapy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, it was not equine therapy. Uh, I get out and I see this huge statue of like St. Joseph or some asshole uh, and it has like the four absolutes like honesty, unselfishness. I don't even know. I don't even know whatever you, you you know right either so I way i was like oh fuck so i guess being an equestrian was out of the picture oh yeah i don't know but it's it's funny though because later in my life i spent a summer in nashville uh, uh-huh. taking care of horses and that was a great experience horses are really good for therapy um my horse's name was memphis memphis and uh yeah and uh so i get out and I had so many like emotions running through my head and like so much uncertainty that I was just like, once I, once I walked up the stairs with these guys next to me, I just slumped in front of the trophy case, you know, like the uh, athletic trophy case. And I was there for like two or three minutes, just like looking at the hallway and like, there wasn't too many people around. And then this huge, another really tall dude, like six foot four staff member. His name was Ted. Um, he, he comes up to me and he leans down into my face and he, and he goes, so what, are you just going to sit there and feel sorry for yourself forever? And I was like, like the fear just intensified, you know? Right. Because because I was, I was chemically fucked up, you know, like, so that kind of like set a tone uh, for me in that place. Like, I- I'm not somebody who trusts anybody easily, you know, call it an adopted kid thing, but I'm always like, uh, very perceptive, but I really often won't say what I'm really thinking about a situation because it's often not very flattering you know or whatever so i i'm taken up to a family at around lunchtime you know and i'm walking through like the kitchen to get there and the place just like nobody's making eye contact with me none of the kids are making eye contact with me they're all kind of just there with their heads down doing whatever the staff members are just kind of like not acknowledging me either you know what i mean so it was like instantly and then i'm just seeing weird signs all over the place that i don't understand and uh but still i felt relieved that i was in a place where i was somehow gonna be safe maybe you know or that someone was gonna help or so you thought yeah no there was no there was no help there for me uh i most certainly will go on record and say that i left there much more full of fear and much more confused than i was when i arrived and i didn't think that was possible you know even years after i graduated but you know through introspection later in my life and getting over trauma, I realized that like it made things way more complicated. Um, <clears throat> so I get up there and I sit down at the table and there's a kid next to me 
And he's like, Hey man, what's up? And I'm like, fuck you. You know, it's just <laughs> thing that comes out of my mouth. Like, fuck <laughs> you. Yeah, you know, like, it was like, yeah. don't fucking talk to me. I just got kidnapped. You know, like, I don't, you know what I mean? Why am I? And then immediately, like without a second thought, he, he says, uh, Oh, you can't curse here. And I was like, fuck this place, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so a lot of it's a blur, you know, like a lot of the early months are a blur. Uh, but a couple of things that definitely stand out to me, the punishments never fit the crime, whatever. And sometimes I, I, I saw, I saw people, okay, okay. I, I want to focus on things that were said to me first, you know? Um, okay, sure. So there was one particular situation that stand two situations that stand out to me as being like the most manipulative fucking gross vile things you could do uh, to someone's mind, especially in like that vulnerable state. They gaslit the shit out of me, you know? Um, and so every Monday, I think we had to dress up, you know, like we had to have collared shirts every day, but Monday was like tie day or something, you know, and everyone had their own ties that you could, parents could have sent you from home. And then there was like, um, the community ties. Yes. Yes. And there was like a particular closet where they were, I guess. And so I went there one day and I was like, let's see if I can get a snazzy tie. You know, and we knew that there was a rule that like when you got your tie on the back or the tag or something, you would write your initials. If it had no initials, it was a community tie. So I find this one tie and it's nice. And then I look at it and I look on the back and one of two things, either I look, I, I think about all the initials of the people in my dorm, you know, and I think, who is this, this, this. And so I, I finally, I found a tie that either had initials I didn't recognize or it had no initials, right? I don't remember which it was truly. And they had already put me on this sanction where like whenever, first of all, they embarrassed me by, they humiliated me in the first couple of months. They, they would put me like, I had to wear rainbow suspenders every day. You know, yeah. They made me wear those for a long time, and I have no idea why they did that. I'm guessing maybe they thought I was gay or something, and they were trying to shame me. And uh, I don't, I, I don't know. But that was embarrassing. And then there was another sanction they put me on where I would get heavily reprimanded by anybody in the school if, whenever I opened my mouth for any reason, I didn't start it by saying, "Hi, my name's Andrew, and I don't know as much as I think I do." I had to say that every single time and I'm sure you're familiar with the table topics, right? Like, yes. you know, or whatever, where they would just literally berate you and strip you of all kind of any kind of, uh, dignity, dignity. Humility. Yeah. That's the word. I, yes. yes. Anything like that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, so with the tie thing, Another kid uh, comes up to me and goes, that's my tie. And I was like, I, okay. Like, you know what I mean? I was like, I got, I thought this was either, you know, like I, I didn't see any indication that it was anyone's tie, you know? And so he, he, this guy was already indoctrinated to some degree, you know? Yeah. I feel, or that at least he was, he was, he had been brainwashed enough to like play ball, I guess. Yeah. Um, play, every, play every, and, I'm, and I'm not shitting on any student or victim who went there for doing that. You know, like you got to do what you got to do in a situation like that. Uh, you know, uh, something that Lenny said in his uh, share that I really resonated with is that like, 
the tenseness and the uncertainty that they like that ha- and how they made the atmosphere at that place manifests in the body and like later in life it really like a lot of my muscles atrophied just from like and as i'm getting over the trauma i'm noticing that my body is releasing like you really had to like shrink down because you never know what was going to happen you know yeah and they they punished me for that tie thing and there was always they had been beating into me that like you're a liar andrew you're a liar you just lie you know like but after enough incidents where I knew that I was telling the truth and they still wouldn't listen to me, that didn't sit right with me anymore. I was like, there's another motive here. Like they don't, they are not interested in the truth. You know, they're interested in something else. And I couldn't exactly say what it was. I couldn't figure it out what they were trying to do. You know, all I knew is that I was in a state of constant fight or flight. And they use that as a way to simplify, you know, like augmenting my behavior, you know, like if someone thinks they're going to die, it's really easy to, to convince them to like drink the, eat the poison apple or whatever, you know? And um, so they, they ended up putting me, you know, in the corner for that. I would just sit in the corner for days at a time and unless I was in class or I even had to eat my meals alone in the corner, you know? And um so I was still trying to figure out what they were getting at, you know, and um, another situation, I was playing basketball and uh, I, I'm a competitive guy and somebody was like playing defense in like a, a less than effective way and I got annoyed. So like I shoulder bumped them, you know, and they not knocked back. And of course, like five or six other people saw me do that. And everyone was just like, like, and instantly when that happens, when you make like a transgression like that, you instantly know that you're you're dreading the rest of the day in fear because you know what's going to happen at dinner time or at lunch time. You're going to turn on you. Yep. Yeah. And then you're going to get called up by one of the family leaders and, you know, you already know that you're not going to be heard. You already know that whether or not you tell the truth about the situation is irrelevant. Right. Um, I can't stress that enough either. And, and that's part of the reason why it was so confusing and scary being there is because I thought I trusted them. Like I did my best, like when I first got there to trust them, I was like, this isn't like my, like for context, my father was the uh, director of an outpatient rehab for 30 years. So I was like somewhat familiar with group therapy, you know, The the inner workings of group therapy. Sure. Yeah. Or interpersonal, like that kind of thing. And so I trusted people who claim to be in a position like that. And they definitely did, you know, like they definitely gave my parents the impression that they were familiar with like how to manage like different mental health disorders and stuff like that, which is not true. They did nothing for any of my mental health disorder. I saw, I saw a psychiatrist one time in that whole visit and it was about four months in and I walked in, he said, so you seem to be having some trouble. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and then he was like, lithium. And he gave me lithium and sent me out. And then I got, you know, for lithium, you have to get your blood tested every couple of weeks or something like that. But that was it. That was it. That was my, the, uh, the totality of my mental health treatment at the family school was that one visit to the psychiatrist who I also didn't trust at that point, you know? Well, lithium, don't they prescribe that to uh, people with, uh, that are psychotic? Hmm. That whole place was psychotic. (laughs) The whole place was, I mean, isn't like a cult, like group psychosis. Yeah. I don't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it, it's almost like group psychosis. It, it you know, like definitely. Um, 
And so, <clears throat> all right, bumping him on the court. So I, I you know, I know at, at, at lunch or dinner, dinner, I get called up and I'm like, like, you know, messed up thing to do playing basketball for fun. And then like, you know, getting physical with someone a little bit more than, you know, instead of saying, Hey man, I don't like the way you're playing defense, just bumping him, you know, that's, you know, whatever. And then they get up and they knew that I had trouble with my younger brother, like where um, when I was a kid, I, I would like older, bro basic older brother stuff. Like you wait your turn, like this kind of thing, like stuff I just did unconsciously. And they used my relationship, like the str my struggling relationship with my little brother as a way to convince me that if I, based on this basketball incident, if I didn't change my ways or like do what they wanted, that one day when I got married, I was going to beat my wife, right? Like they, they convinced me that I was like a violent evil, dishonest snake of a person. And that my only, my only way for like salvation, I guess you could call it was to see, that's the thing is I didn't understand what they wanted me to do. I never understood what they wanted me to do. Um, Everything was so everything was so vague. It wasn't uh, really explained very well. It's was, because they weren't. They were lying to us. They were lying to us, and one of the most hurtful things is that there were staff members there who like were plants to be there to be like the nice ones. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, 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 good, like good cop, bad cop type of thing. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And one of my family, family leaders was one of those people. Um, I, I think that Lenny also mentioned his first name. His name was Terry. And, uh, you know, he was a minister or like, he was like a, an altar boy type, you know, he went all the full route with like uh, Catholicism, you know, and um, so he would be like, God is truth. God is love. What is God? God, you know, like he, he and he would get us in these assembly uh, in the gymnasium with all these set up chairs and he would just talk for like an hour and he would ask us questions, but the questions he was asking us, he was almost like, it was very, author it was, it was very authoritative, you know, almost like there was only one right answer. And if you got the answer wrong, he was like, nope, wrong. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Yeah. It, what's the name of that movie where they're all, it, it was like a clockwork orange in a sense, but you know, whatever. Um, I forgot like where a, I was going with that. It's almost like a Stanley Kubrick film, huh? <laughs> it, it, you know, and the thing is, is that I kept my head down. Like, w one of the ironic things is that with that, like, I don't, I'm not as smart as I think I am, or what, I don't know as much as I think I do, is that I found out how smart I actually am at that place, you know? Yeah. Like, it's one of the things that saved me. Uh, from completely drowning or whatever. Um, the thing with people being in the in that isolation box in the gymnasium, you know what I mean? Like, if you didn't see someone for too long, you knew that they were getting beat down, you know? Um, and it, it was almost... It, it was almost like uh, the, the kid who committed suicide there, um, jumping off the balcony. I think he did that in like 2004. 
Um, someone said they had. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, someone said they had like a plaque there. I never saw it. I'm not saying it wasn't there. I'm just saying I never saw it. But like, how fucking dare they? How dare they like put a plaque there? You know? Yeah. Like, I I still don't know. Is is this about money? Like, I'm talking directly to these people if they ever see this. Like, is was this about money? Was this about low self esteem? Was this about power for you? You know, like, was this about your own personal failings in life? You know, like, did you fail with your children and now you want to fuck up everyone else's? So what do you want? I don't know. I, I One thing I don't understand is, is you know, b- being that you know, these kids are troubled, okay? And there's, there, that, that's pretty much a, a wide spectrum. Troubled can mean anything. Anywhere from somebody who misbehaves to somebody who is actually committing violence, okay? And these people actually think that the only way of rehabilitating is to lie, lying and conjoling and, 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 and manipulating and humiliating and degrading. You think that's going to help the person? That's gonna, Like you said, it just makes it worse. You come out more confused and you come out angrier. Negative, re- negative reinforcement as a way of behavior modification is for stupid people. I'll just say it. It's the lazy, stupid way, you know, like instead of instead of working with someone slowly through positive reinforcement and getting to know them on an emotional level, you can just abuse them and put them in a position where um, and and then point them towards something that's going to take away the, you know, take away the, the for a moment, the feeling of abuse that you inflicted upon them, you know, like that's part of of what I had to go through with like recovering from this is the idea that like, Oh, they helped me with this, but they caused the fucking problem. You know? Right. What what I was saying is something like, uh, like take for instance, like a battered wife syndrome where, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the husband beats up the wife. Yeah. He's got problems, but he's such a good person. You know, say they were hoping that you were going to conform from hating them. To saying, well, it's not that bad. Maybe I did deserve it. You know that whatever I got, that bu- the box Munchausen got, syndrome, something like that. Munchausen, like 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 falling falling in love with your captors, or yes. something like that. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yes. So. So yeah, yeah. They were going for. Some, they were definitely going for something. Yeah, that, like I that. think that's what they're. They were gearing towards that kind of uh, rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Ironically, that guy Ted was uh, an alumni of that school from 1991, right? So that's – I didn't know that until later, and that was, like it, – it, it brought, like, a whole new dimension of, like, the kind of things that people struggle with, you know. No, but, like, a big, a big part of the reason ratting, – ratting people out was a huge part of getting by in that place. Like – I'm sure you've heard about this like anchor pin situation, you know? Okay. Maybe not. No, but there's always like, there's always like the elder members, the people like the senior members and then the newbies. It's not said in so many words, but um, that's the implication there. There's kids there who have been there longer and they're almost put in like a de facto position of power over the newer kids because they know it's like it's like going to prison. Yeah, it's like they know the rules there, and they can take their frustrations and whatever out on you if they want to. Right. You know, they and can. There's, and there's basically some unwritten rules that you have to, uh, you know, figure out. Basically, you have to figure them out. Yes, no one, no one's going to tell you what they are. You know, yeah, basically just by observing, you know what I mean? And just, just, you know, doing a little reconnaissance, so to speak. Yeah. And there's problems with that, though, because there's people undoubtedly there at some who, who were suffering from. Like eating disorders, you know, like. Um, schizophrenia, you know, like bipolar disorder, Um and like 
aversion therapy and like gaslighting people who are already struggling to figure out whether or not their reality is like safe or not or like igniting and activating underlying mental illness you know like because because most of the people who worked there that you were interacting with on a day-to-day basis were picked off the street you know yeah and sometimes they had sometimes they had undiagnosed disorders you know what i mean that they haven't been diagnosed yet and they don't find out until they start gaslighting them and before my big problem yeah so i disassociated for most of my stay there my outlet was academics and athletics you know um but there's no there was no love there there was no love or compassion there whatsoever. It's hard for me to just look and hone on specific things that I saw. Um, but I've seen kids get tackled. Um, now this was a, was this, was this a co-ed, co-ed school, right? You, you interact yes. with girls too. You bring up a good point. Um, I, I, I think I think one of the biggest issues that I had leaving there was interacting with women at all. You know, um, they dismantled any kind of sexual confidence at all that I had. You know, like I mean, I was seventeen, so it's like I had a strong grasp. Of, some some seventeen year olds have a strong grasp of their sexuality, but I didn't. You know, um, mm-hmm. and like yeah. The, the message that I got was that that authoritative, cruel, unrelenting voice remained with me um, and, uh, for, uh, it, it still exists, you know, it still exists for me now in the sense that if I make a mistake or I do something that is less than virtuous, no matter how I beat the shit out of myself emotionally, like, and I realized that that voice comes directly, the magnitude of that voice comes directly from that place. You know, it comes from, I had an impending sense of doom the entire time I was there. Um, And I kept on thinking up until the very end when I was getting ready to graduate, that somehow they were going to lighten up or tell me, tell me the big secret about what was going on, you know? Right. As you were, as you were starting to, 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 uh, getting close to leaving. Yeah. You thought maybe they would say, Hey, you know, this is, you know, we really, we did it for this certain reason. You know what I mean? And uh, we just want you to let you know, that's why we did it. But there was nothing like that. Yeah. No, there's no, there was no reconciliation. Um, I'm trying to like focus a lot on the feelings because everybody, everybody who went there um, had their own particular flavor of abuse, you know? Right. And, I refuse to play ball to such a degree, you know, and, and the more that they realized that I wasn't going to do that or that I wasn't doing that, the worse the punishments got. So there was a certain point at which they wouldn't allow me to talk to anybody, you know, and if I did talk at all, I had to embarrass myself to do so, you know, like, they sh- it's kind of like it's not a flashy form of abuse you know what i mean uh, you know like i never yeah. got i wasn't i wasn't sexually abused there um no staff members ever put their hands on me 
anything like that that I can remember. I, I, I doubt it. But um, they saw that I was, like, confused and about whatever in my life, and they played on that heavily. They, sh- they shamed me, and they used, like, my weaknesses against me. He- you know? And... It was mental abuse, basically. Yeah. Like, really heavy mental abuse. Which and I just, remember... Which is just as bad as, you know, sexual abuse or physical abuse. It's just as bad. It's, it's all a matter of perception, you know? Um, that's something that I've... Uh, started to realize is that it's all a matter of perception and um, it has nothing to do with an individual's mental fortitude or fortitude in any way. You know, it's about the fact that at a certain point, all of us felt that we were in peril. You know, we were put in a position where we felt like we were in peril. I don't want to speak for everybody, but I can only imagine, you know, um, and once they had us like in the bear trap, you know, they made us watch Passion of the Christ, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So oh. <laughs> I actually have a story about that too. Uh, okay. <laughs> they would give us a choice on like Friday nights about like two different activities that we could do sometimes. And it was always like shitty and shittier. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I mean, do do you want the shit sandwich or do you want the puke milkshake? Which one do you want? Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think South Park did. What are they? Turd sandwich or giant douche? You know, <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Um, but uh, like, I, I made I made a I made a commitment to myself when I came on here that I wasn't going to use it like a therapy session. You know, because I want people. to hear my true experience. Um, I hear about, I hear about kids who are now adults who went there in the nineties and, and also the, uh, the agape school, you know, which is actually, which is now closed. Oh, it is now closed, but it gets worse. Okay. It gets, it got better. It closed. Actually it closed. uh, It was either today or yesterday, but they, reopened it as another group home called stone of help. So, which is basically just a slap in the face to the agape kids that went there, you know, basically tell yeah. them, Hey, you can't shut us down. We'll show no justice. Down. We're going to come. Exactly. Yeah. No justice whatsoever. And that's the other thing too, is that I want to encourage anybody else who is on the fence about whether or not they are able or to, to share their story honestly, you know, or at least share it at all, any part of it, like, please do it, you know, please do it. Um, for, (laughs) I mean, like there's certain people that I liked there, like certain kids, but it's how, they manipulated how I viewed people, you know, and, you know, I, I, that same, that same person with the, the tie situation, a few, like a week after we graduated, I was on, cause they graduated like six months before me. I was on uh, Facebook. I got on Facebook for the first time and we became friends on Facebook and I posted a picture of myself And the comment that he sent me was, you are a terrible self-hating Jew. Right? And then me thinking that he's just joking because I can take a joke. You know, I'm Jewish. (laughs) And he was like, uh, good luck offending a Jew. You know, one with a sense of humor anyway. (laughs) Um, He, I I then said, am I that obvious? (laughs) You know? And he said, yes. But later... I realized that like one of the, one of the worst repercussions of this for me personally is my lack of compassion for the other kids who suffered there. 
post graduation, you know, mm-hmm. like I'm a compassionate person, you know, like I'm an empathetic person by nature. Um, and to look at other victims who went through the same thing that I did and, you know, to be judgmental of them, you know, it's almost like I was talking to them like I was indoctrinated, which I was to a degree, you know, I guess. Yeah. And you were, you were. Yeah. And so, and so like I had to go through that and I had to look at the, I had to figure out what was true about me and what wasn't, which is an excruciating alcohol fueled oxycodone fueled process, you know, like, um, I am in October, I'll have three years sober, you know, and, um, you know, like the only, I'll say this, and I know this is like a divisive thing, but I'm just going to say it, um, because it's my truth, not because I'm trying to bring up trouble, but AA has helped me immensely. Alcoholics Anonymous has helped me immensely. Um, and the issue with that place is that the message that is and granted like the stuff in the AA big book is like, has heavy, heavy Christian undertones, you know, it does. Oh, There's yeah, no way around. There's no way around that. You know, like it does. Talks um, about, a, talks about a higher power and all that. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but like what it helped me do is it's, it's not necessarily the meetings. It's about, it's about not being afraid to look at the truth about myself and then looking at the things that I've learned that are untrue, whether I learned them on my own or because they were beaten savagely into me, um, dis- discarding them and letting them go like without regret. And, <clears throat> but the level, the level of emotional, uh, mental confusion at the constant, like, like, if you're, if you're struggling with expressing your needs, and then you finally ex- figure out your needs and you express them truthfully, and then someone says, you're fucking lying, you're a fucking liar, you know, like, you can't be trusted with anything. You can't even be trusted walking down the halls by yourself. You can't be trusted shitting by yourself, you know? Like, any time I had to use the bathroom up until the day I graduated, um, I had to go into that little closet-sized bathroom in Family 8 and shit with somebody else in there right in front of me, you know? Like Humil- Humiliating. It, they, they, humiliation was like their tool of choice, I think, you know, because the table topics, um, again, like the brain injury, I brought that up too. It's difficult because I was suffering like the fallout of the brain trauma when I was there also, like it was hard from, you know, I feel like it was a, it was beneficial maybe even to a certain degree, at least in surviving, you know, because there are times where I definitely thought about like, I wonder if there's drain cleaner here, you know, I wonder if there's any kind of drain cleaner or something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but as far as like uh, my experiences with watching other people, I decided that I didn't, I didn't rat people out, you know, and that's why I was never elevated to like, like usually when you're in your last few months of your stay, they give you some kind of like, uh, accolade, I guess you could call it for like, for being a member of the community, but I never felt like I was a member of that community. And I saw what was happening to other kids. Like 
again, I'll say it, Lenny in particular, you know, I don't think there was a person in family eight who wasn't pissed off when they took away Lenny's guitar. Right. Like when they took away Lenny's guitar, we like, then every time he came back from the isolation room, like we were like, you're literally killing him. You know, like you're literally killing this kid. Trust me. And, I'm, a, I'm a guitar player. I know exactly what you mean. And I'm going to nerd out about him for a second. Um, <laughs> Lenny is what we call a natural. If he's heard the song, he can play it on the guitar. I think I asked him if he knew how to read music and he said, nope. He just knows how to use a guitar. It's crazy. It was the most amazing thing I ever saw. And it helped me. I, I commented this on that video, but it helped me greatly to just sit in front of him and say, play this. And he would just do it instantly, you know? And um, some people have that ability. Yeah. So like, I don't know. So what happened? Uh, we were, you were talking about this and you, I, I don't know if it, if it was, that was the end of it or we didn't get into it, but you said something about the passion of the Christ. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so they, first of all, that movie is fucking stupid. Right? Yeah. Um, Two hours of seeing a Jew and get beat and whipped and put on a cross. And fuck Mel Gibson. You know? <laughs> what an asshole. What an asshole. The Patriot was okay, but he's an asshole. I have to and, admit, the Patriot was good. But yeah, I, I saw The Passion of the Christ. That didn't, didn't do anything for me. Yeah, and I, I started to like, as we were sitting, it was almost like supposed to be like a movie night. This was supposed to be like, this was a leisure activity for us, right? You can imagine what like the rest of the stay was like, if that was our leisure activity, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it, it's, it, it seems like I'm not getting specific enough, but that's, I shut down, man. Like I shut down so early um, that I think that their only way of communicating with me was like, just to, just to, I was like experimented on in terms of different kinds of punishment, you know? Well, would it have been different if they said they're going to watch Fiddler on the Roof? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, lo I love that movie. I love that movie. So, <laughs> um, I'll admit to you, I haven't seen it. Oh, it's about Is that William Shatner. No, that's, it was in 1972. I believe it was Topol. Okay. Um, um, it, it, there, it's story of Russian Jews. So I have like, some homework to do then. Yeah, yeah it's it's like a, a musical basically. It, but what it's, you know what? Very good. It's very good. Since I know we only have, have that much time left, but uh, the choir teacher, uh -huh. right? Um, I looked at him, and the way that he looked at some of the students, and I was like, this dude wants to fuck some of these kids like you know what i mean like he is and then later when he was accused of uh like multiple accounts you know personal accounts of him touching them or propositioning kids i mean girls and boys what well, he was an admitted sex addict like a lot of the a lot of the staff members that worked there i imagine like couldn't get jobs anywhere else you know because of their history or something or whatever and they just decided to go there i don't know but also the you know i've i, I have people uh fellow 
members of that school who I talked to afterwards who are also like supremely confused about their sexuality. A lot of people, uh, transgender, uh, gay, like any LGBTQ, um, you think I suffered for my sexuality. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm straight. You know what I mean? Like, right. and, and just imagine being gay and not being able to tell anybody because of the humiliation and the degradation you would suffer. If you, if you, let's say, said it to somebody, said it to somebody that you thought you could trust. And all of a sudden they just blurt it out to everybody. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, that's, to, to hide that is it's not healthy. So, like, an hour is not long enough, man. You know, an hour is really not long enough. Uh, well, we can always do a part two, Andrew. Yeah, so. I mean, you know, a, a lot of it too is that. I don't want to think I, I, I don't want to I'm afraid of reliving some of that stuff you know like I'm afraid for the tent my 20s were a shit show my 20s were a shit show like I couldn't I didn't trust anyone you know like I didn't I didn't trust anyone to tell them how I was feeling ever because I thought as soon as I did they were going to right not like what's gonna ha it's it's the same feeling that i had when i was at the school like what's gonna happen like the sense of impending doom it was almost like well that's because that's what you had to endure day after day it was hammered into yeah. your head yes i mean and uh Man, psychological yeah. manipulation, man, is. I mean, some 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 people get over it. Some people don't. Some people, years and decades, you know. Yeah. Of, it just it's it's it haunts them. It's it it stays with them no matter how much they try to to shrug it off and say this we're not there anymore. It just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and it just it screws but you to up. Some, to tell someone that they have to believe in God. Or they're going to be a vile person or, yeah. like, be unlovable, you know? Like, God loves you. But meanwhile, there's no love anywhere, you know? It's almost like maybe if we treat them bad enough and make this as an ungodly place as we can, maybe they'll turn to christianity yeah hey man like personally i think like a lot of you know like lifelong religious people or self-proclaimed religious people are traumatized beyond belief yeah that's an opinion that's some an opinion are. some are yeah um some do it because but, of a some do it because of a traumatic experience. Some do it because they were they were born into it. You know, mm -hmm. that's depends. that's true. That's true. That might be a bit judgmental on my part. I didn't mean it that way. Um, oh, that's okay. It's okay. Just your opinion. You know what I mean? That's that's what yeah. we're here for. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It takes me it takes me a while to like warm up and stuff because um, even even maybe being on the podcast like to some degree is like if i get too specific it's going to be used against me i know that it won't i know that you won't you know right, right. um <laughs> um but that's that's the part that they created or manipulated there was that part right there you know like yeah. they made they made it so difficult for us only I, to... I, I, I would be honest to say that uh, everybody has, to some degree, 
trust issues. You know what I mean? But this place made it worse. You know what I mean? You may have had a small little trust issue. Now, all of a sudden, it's just spiraled out of control, you know, because of this place. It's... It's a it, it's a continuing cycle. It's like a generational cycle of fear, you know? Because you can't make someone that afraid if you aren't familiar with that level of fear, you know? It's like It's it's fuck again. It's just like oh, this is effective. There's a very clear change in their behavior as a result of this type of um, augmentation, you know. So let's just do that because it's effective. Like you're leaving out you're leaving out the individual part. Like they stripped us of all individuality. We weren't allowed to be ourselves there, you know. Like because ourselves were lying, sinful, uh, untrustworthy. According you know, to them. like name, because I really feel for people who had no behavior issues whatsoever who were sent there as like, oh, it's a therapeutic school that focuses on like, you know, like there was one kid that was there for five, six years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's so much different than a year and a half. Yeah. Basically it's basically it's behavior modification or their version of behavior modification. It's a you could without exaggerating too many details, you could make a horror movie out of this. You know? Yeah. You could. Um, I don't know. For, I thought about the Joker instantly. Like Joaquin Phoenix's interpretation of the Joker. Yes. You know? Like, I, saw the, I saw the movie. <laughs> uh, like, if anything, if anything, like, being there ter- made me feel homicidal. You know? Like... Like if someone if someone like did something that I found morally reprehensible to any degree, I would think about killing them. I would get so angry, but I realized that all that anger was at you know the people there from the school and I'm sorry, but like nobody there's hands were clean. none of the staff members' hands were clean from the nurses to the uh, to the receptionists. They were all in on this idea that this was the way that you rehabilitate children, you know? Yeah. And anything else, they were so convinced and so arrogant that they were right that any kind of dissension, no matter how violent it was, was treated as a moral failure. Right? Yeah. Which couldn't be further from the truth. First of all, who the fuck are you to judge my morality? You know? Like, all you should be concerned about is if you're living up to your own morals. And to me, everyone there, everyone there had, every staff member had given up on their own morals, you know, long ago. So I went to that dude Terry's funeral and I realized, as I was about to say, I know we're wrapping up it. This was about six months after I left. I went to his funeral. And then even as I was driving there, I was like, why am I doing this? I feel compelled to do this, but I can't figure out why I'm doing this. And only recently did I realize that the reason that I went wasn't to see the other students. It wasn't to grieve his death. It was to make sure he was dead. I don't know how to explain any different than that, but knowing that he was dead was like a solace to me. It was like a relief, like knowing that I still, I live in my, you see that door behind me. That's the door to outside to to the hallway to in my apartment building. Mm -hmm. Whenever I hear someone open the door there, it's pretty audible through the door. Um, 
my heart jumps because I'm worried if someone's going to come into my house and take me somewhere against my will, you know? Yeah. That still, that still happens to me. Um, and, uh, so, so like, but the last thing I guess for now, I would definitely come on to a part two, but I also don't want to make this all about me. Um, like, I lost it. I lost it. But, uh, <laughs> like, if if anything, like, a lot of, you know, like, a lot people on, people, this is, oh, oops. This is also the brain injury. Like, I have a hard time, like, my left and right hemispheres in my brain don't communicate well with each other, so people have to reel me in often, so, um, I don't feel like I got to the heart of the matter here ultimately, but you know, like I want to, I, I, I really want to continue and encourage people um, to, to do what they can in a manageable way to like trust, to trust that there actually are good people in the mental health field, you know, uh, because rightly so throwing the baby out with the bathwater is something that I think is a natural response. At least I feel in my heart that it's a natural response in this kind of situation. You know what I mean? Basically a lot of people just got given up on basically. Like they create addicts there. They create alcohol alcoholics there you know drug addicts as well yeah i mean no if you want to completely i don't blame anybody for wanting to completely blot out there i spent my 20s doing that blotting out the memories of you know being at the family foundation school you know and uh that's why I say I think the brain injury worked to my advantage because it was easy for me to disassociate and, uh, no, uh, yeah. you know, All right. but, uh, no. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and stop it right there. Uh, like I said, if you want to come on, we'll, we'll, I'll keep in touch with you and, uh, you know, we could do another, Another one. I would uh, like to. Sure. I think sure. I was I was less prepared for this informationally than I anticipated. You know, I, I thought that when I came on here, I was going to like be remember a lot of specifics, but like it's so difficult to talk about. It's right. So it's so difficult to talk about. So write right, down some bullet points, and we'll do that again. All right, Andrew, thanks for coming on, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. You're and welcome. Uh, you have a great night. Well, hold, hold on for. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Here. That's right. And uh, <laughs> all right. So let me go ahead and end the show. I want to thank everybody for coming on. I'm like, once again, I want to thank Andrew for coming and giving his story. Uh, just to let you know, hopefully, I can get this up by tonight. Uh, tomorrow, I have a live podcast. With Rocco, he was at the Missouri, make sure I get this right, the Missouri Baptist Children's Home. Um, so he's going to be on at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. And Sunday at 2 o'clock, I'm having the open forum. You're not going to want to miss this one. This one is probably crazier than the one I did a week, last week. <laughs> I, I, really, like really I like fun. crazy. It's all good. Oh, man, it's a crazy world. <laughs> So yeah. for the Hammer Podcast, I'm Jason. You take care of yourself. You take care of each other. And we'll see you in the next podcast. Right? Okay.